Uh, welcome, we've got an amazing lineup of panelists here uh, who are going to answer some of my banal questions but then also take some questions from you lot because I'm sure you've got some and you've got some really good expertise here that can offer some great advice or whatever scale of yeah, <laughs> whatever scale of, uh, of manufacturing you're looking at or what equipment you're using. I think we've got some great stuff. I'm going to let um, uh, ladies first, I'll let Christina introduce herself first and then we work back along the line to give you an example of who's here. Uh, my name is Christina Sejma and I work for Photocentric. Good, I'm uh, Ben Schrauen, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Octon. Hi there, Alexander Pluk, CEO of Additive Flow. Nice to see you all here today. Good afternoon, I'm Pat Warner, I'm the additive manufacturer at Alpine Formula One Team. I swear to God, Alex flew me in an Orion Air once with that address. Um, so, first question I've got is that recently, editorially, everyone was talking about lightweighting. Everyone was making everything lighter. But what's the thing that people should be considering that maybe additive or other technologies can really offer their products? So, what do you pass? Um, yeah, obviously to us, lightweighting is everything. Um, we, we spend huge amounts of money trying to make everything as light as possible, um, but we've got the advantage of it and it really needs to last a very short period of time. Um, so we have a, a two hour race limit. So we're not in the realms of aerospace, where they want 50 years. But yeah, lightweight is great, but you've got to ensure that it fulfills the task for the duration of the product's life. So Demetrius is relatively short as well. Life expectancy of a bicycle and a rider. <coughs> Not as short as Formula One teams, but relatively small window of, of, of competitiveness. Um, but if you're putting it on an aircraft or a conventional road car, then you'd look in at 10, 20, 50 years. That's a different world. So in that case for you, it would be materials maybe? Well, materials and, and like design for manufacture, but making sure that the design is, is valid and not just about how light can I make it. it it's, 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 it's life cycle as well, which is also important. Great. Alex? Life cycle, Pat. Yeah. Speaking my language. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I think once you've got your design, it becomes a question of how are you going to produce it, how are you going to meet your business case, how are you going to ensure that your quality is consistent as you're scaling, hopefully you're scaling your production. And that's where lightweighting is just a tiny sliver of the step to bring your costs down. Then it comes down to parameterization, how you're getting your certification accelerated. And that's a whole other story, which we're working on, of course. Yeah, so most of the 3D, so probably 99% of all the 3D printed parts today in production are actually not about lightweighting at all. Um, they're about reducing tooling costs. For example, with clear aligners, it's really a tooling cost game. It's an application that existed before you're reducing the tooling cost. There's some lightweighting component to it, but it's really to make the tool cheaper. Um, it's not about the, the lightness of it. It's just like re reducing tool cost. There is um, uh, mass customization, which is really not about tool cost. There's part consolidation, which is about having less uh, assembly complexity. Um, Osteo integration, yeah, you're also using lattices, but it's really not about being light, it's about getting better bone in growth. So, yeah, like in some industries, like single use rockets or uh, um, anything that has to do with like uh, racing, lightweighting is interesting, but I think for many other industries, like lightweighting is maybe an afterthought. So, yeah, the freedom of design that you mentioned, Mitri, that was a perfect example. Uh, but also better with the parts, better uh, you know, better performance in the parts. Like uh, we can prevent problems like warping by uh, inserting lattices in products. So you can make a completely different part, a better finish, just by uh, changing the design. Excellent. So prototyping is still a huge part of. I mean, if you've got product designers here, I know we've got a few in um, prototyping and producing test parts is a huge part of the process. Do you think we'll ever go directly from a digital model straight to a physical real end use part? Yeah, that's, that's the ultimate goal, but before scaling up and going into mass manufacture, right? So 
that's what we'll want, but it's still not quite there yet. Uh, but uh, you know, obviously, automation and tools can uh, can take us that way. Because obviously, Photocentric just signed a deal for a factory. Yes. Innovation. So that's that's right. So we, we are working on a, an automation autonomously single flow line that uh, can sort of uh, you know put rest in one part and get a usable part on the other. Again. Like maybe if we're like in this fully VR world where we can like hold a part digitally and we can see how the assembly might work, yeah, then we might be able to move away from from prototyping. But I think we're we're not there yet. There's like there's so much value in in holding the part and seeing how multiple components come together, like looking at the ergonomics of of the assembly workflows and all of that. Uh, I do think that we'll we'll be able to. Uh, shorten the prototyping cycles where even <coughs> even if the design is not fully finished we might actually already go for like a pre-production run like, the, like currently with additive and some of the software solutions you're able to really get the batch sizes to be much smaller so you can go to production with an earlier version of your product and then keep iterating it while the product is in market or historically you needed to iterate iterate on a prototype until it's totally locked in and then you get like the million dollar mold made I think like the digital tools allow you to um, iterate while the while, uh, keep iterating while the product is already in market. And I suppose if we're we're looking at where does prototyping actually sit within your life cycle of the product, it's in that application development step, right? It's where you're working out what your material is. Maybe you fixed your design, maybe you haven't. You may be still choosing which machine to manufacture something on, which process to use to enable your goals to be met. And that application development and additive can be many months, 18 months, maybe even years for certain components. And I think if we're looking at additive and digital technologies to accelerate this application development down, what are the key features that are going to do that? And that's predictability, repeatability of material properties, repeatability of a production process, and understanding digitally how something will perform, and understanding digitally what the right decision is to take as your production life cycle is actually scaling up. So I would never say we might want to skip prototyping entirely because also engineers would have much less fun in their jobs. But also, it's actually a really useful part if you're thinking about prototyping for testing. So you're testing as much as possible in that section of application development. Do you think we manufacture or do we prototype? You, oh, yeah. F1 teams. We don't have, I, I, we don't I, have I got a kiss and hope, but. We, we go straight from cab to pad and we use it and we race it. Yeah, we but, but we only make six of anything. And by which time we've moved on, we've refined it. The track's different. Yeah, so you keep iterating while the product is already yeah, yeah. in market. But we have to because every, yeah. every racetrack is different. Yeah. Every ambient temperature, every time we go, is a different environment. There's wet, dry, hot, cold. Low downforce, low downforce, different ambient temperatures, but we go from cab to cab and we race it and we prove it and we use it and we throw it away and start again. <laughs> so is it prototyping or is it manufacturing? What is I'll it that enables you to do I can come here to answer so any questions. <laughs> I'm backing down immediately. I, I, did, I, did, I did do that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'd say in, in, in a real world, I guess we don't manufacture anything as such. You know, we, we make six, maybe ten, and then and then we, we move on to the next design or, or the next performance game, whatever that may be. But we are using what we design, whether it be additive, composite, subtractive, straight from cat. My next question, before I open it up to the floor, because then hopefully you've got enough to work with to get some nice questions in. What's the thing you see in the near future, near future, that's going to change workflows most? Things like materials or software, or don't just promote your own thing, Alex. Um, materials, software, setups, um, you know, what, what is it going to make a difference to people here when they're making their parts? If they want to try and make smaller runs or make more use of technology, what's the thing? What are you looking at, Pat? I would say it's all probably software driven for us. I mean, as, as Dimitri's presentation showed, that from getting to in his case, the rider position, but in our case, the rule book, to the perfect product, whether it be a wing, a chassis, an entire car is, is irrelevant. The, the, the quickest way to get to that 
for us is is a lot longer than we would like it. Um, we would like to spend more time with CFD. We would like to give the aerodynamicists more time to to do their thing prior to getting to the track. We leave that as long as we can, hence we love all the additive and tallest design from it because the aerodynamicists will tell me on Thursday what we're racing on Saturday. That's that's yeah. something. That's not that's not uncommon. So so, so we don't have time for talking. Um, but yeah, the, the more the more help you can give them with software, be it CFD, through to generic design, through to placement in the machine, is is key. And the more we the more we can get out of those packages, the more time we'll have to do all the the hard work of development in between. Did you just ask me the perfect question, Stephen? I think so. Um, so, of course. Um, I think the workflow that you need to employ to actually deploy additive is currently moving between silos. I mean, Pat, you just spoke about three or four teams, right? To get to something at the end. They may be using three or four software packages or more. And that data exchange from your requirements to your build can take ages. I mean, I use the anecdote that I once spent 80 hours, 80 hours moving from one package to another just to get my part that I'd already designed and selected onto the actual build plate. And that was one of the drivers to doing additive flow. Um, and we can do that work for now in a few minutes. But if you look across the industry, you've got people like Octon2 also looking at this workflow being compressed to enable the engineers really to do their job, to do their high value job. And that's where the people are sometimes say, hey, look, we're going to automate things. We're going to get software to do everything. No, it's about getting the software to take out the frustrating bits that mean that Pat might throw a part against the wall because it's a slightly different geometry than, well, I don't know if you do do that, but <laughs> um, because it's some, some frustrating thing in the software. Um, and it's reducing that overhead. It's reducing that risk, that, that uncertainty. And that's what I think the software is doing now a lot better than it used to do. Um, where you've got something in, in the deck, in the machine, it comes out, it's as you need it, consistently. I think that's where we're going towards. Yeah, good. And so I, I totally agree. It's across materials, machines, software. Have, have you seen what happened the last five years on the materials front? A lot of new alloys are coming out in metals, like really being able to do things with alloys that were uniquely developed for additive where you get material performance that you're not able to get out of any other like casting or metal forming technology in polymers like if you look at the material spectrum like like additive was all the way like destroyed materials here at the top now there is uh it, it's it's incredible both both with uh, with the resin based as, as well as the um the like, extruded materials performance of, of polymers is is really ready for uh, for really industrial use cases, then on the material on the machines side, uh, like we had general purpose lab equipment basically up until not too long ago. Now all the 3D printing companies are building uh, production optimized machines, really making sure that the most expensive part of the machine, the laser for example, is just on the whole time. You can swap out build plates, like a lot of investment in in very highly automated post processing equipment to make sure that uh, the, the Achilles heel of additive is post-processing. The, the stuff that nobody tells you is like all the, the manual uh, dremeling that happens afterwards. Uh, like those things are being addressed right now. And then, yeah, like like was mentioned before, software is, is the key that brings it all together. And especially if you want to scale things to production, like during the design process, you really need to like, uh, and, and that's where we, we, we at Octon really focus is like, being able to connect design to your production environment and being able to design for the maximum optimized use in your production environments, looking at the whole flow, not just printing, but printing with post-processing, with, with, with the machining that, 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 that might need, uh, need, need to happen. And I think yeah, like all these three coming together, it's really just been happening the last like three, four years. So I'm, I'm really excited how fast the, uh, the whole space is, is accelerating. All right, and Christian? Yes, I agree. So, at the end of the day, what, what we want is, you know, for it to work, you, want, you have a design or an idea, and, and you want to get to the final part as, as smoothly, as uh, effectively as you can. That's, that's the whole point, right? So, each part, if, if you have incremental uh, 
improvements in each part, everything, you know, the end adds up. But for me, the, the control uh, software is, is a really important key uh, factor in that. Because uh, to, to join the dots and to know at every stage of the process what's happening and what, hap what needs to happen next and where we are with each part, I think that's you know, one of the key. We should, we should talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've all got some ideas for each other. Right. <laughs> Right, I want to open this to the floor. Sue's got a good question. A good question. Oh, go on. <laughs> a good question. I will be. Thank you. Um, so, as an academic, I spend a lot of time with our students trying to prepare them for encountering or working with additive when they go out into their careers. I guess my question for all of you is, what things do you wish that they came to you knowing if you have people joining your companies or your departments or your groups or whatever? What's, what's the one thing you wish people came in knowing about additive? <coughs> Wow, that's a question. Go on, Pat. You mean that's a good question? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a good question, but, but it's just, yeah, it, it's, there's, 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 there's lots to say I, I wish they had. There's, there's also lots of stuff to say I wish they hadn't. Um, we've, we've, had a, we've had a number of 3D printing experts, I'll say, <laughs> turn up in our design office knowing all about 3D printing having seen a desktop FDM machine. And that's not the world we live in. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Like, like it's overhyped, but then they know everything about like this incredibly crude technology that really very few people use in true production. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's, that's probably my biggest take, is that to understand the differences. I, I don't know what we teach them, but um, or to the full extent. But, <laughs> And also, I don't know what they have access to on a, on a regular basis. Um, and I imagine what you're doing is different to what I'm seeing. Um, so, but yeah, I, I'd like them to have more exposure to more industrial equipment. Um, and understand the strength of each of the different and, and, and understand the difference between each one of them. And, and know the difference between uh, uh, an SLA machine, an SLS machine, an FDM machine. And a, and a, had a fusion machine. It's, it, that's that to me is the key, the key thing because everyone's it's becoming three D printing again. Mm -hmm. If you see what I mean, we, we've kind of we've gone from rapid prototypes <coughs> and rapid manufacturing, and now everyone's going down the route of becoming three D printing again, which is kind of good in some respects. But if if they're pulling everything together and think it's all the same, then it, it doesn't do us any. Yeah, it's like trying to like combine a plethora of 50 plus technologies into one bracket and you think it's the same and it's not. And I just, as a, because we work with a lot of young people, Kickstarters and the Kickstarter program was around, we have interns in all the time. And it takes sometimes at least a month, depending on how long they're with us, to change their mindset. It's a connected mindset. It's, you know, integrating a simulation experience with your production, your materials and so on. And it's really coming from the scientific method. I mean, that's something that our software does, it connects that whole workflow together. But I think I would like to hope that you know, future education policy and, and approaches are bringing that mindset together and actually being practically confident in delivery, practically confident in executing real world projects that you might actually see in an aerospace or a Formula One or a chainsaw manufacturer, right? And one of the things that I feel and it's not education's fault, but it's our tools fault. A lot of the digital tools, the CAD tools were developed in the eighties when machining, casting was the predominant way to make things. And so these ways of making are just ingrained in how CAD tools work. Start with a sketch, you extrude the sketch, you like uh, put in a hole, like do some chaffering. Those are basically machining operations. So you design in machining operations. And then like all these students go through all these CAD courses and they come out just by themselves, always designing things that are easily machinable. If you then ask them to just do something in additive where you need to think much more creatively because there's much more design freedom. You need to take the process more into account, like how is it going to be oriented and, and, and look at the simulation results to then use that to drive your design process. Um, I think that that is that. It's something they're not very aware of, but the way the way they think about the design is very much structured by the tools we give them, which are really seeded on 
yeah, designing for machining from back in the 80s. Um, and I think that's going to take a bit longer to shift. And I see a lot of people that learn DFAM basically need to unlearn machining. Um, can, I, can I continue? Uh, <coughs> like, uh, I was actually discussing this with uh, somebody recently that uh, was coming from a machining company. And they were trying to implement additive manufacturing in that. And uh, he was saying that uh, our engineers, what they do is you start with a block of material and you cut a hole there, uh, you machine a pocket here, and so on and so forth. And uh, I had to explain to him that the way that I work is you putting on what are the important points in space and you find the most effective way of connecting them, which is more or less what generative design is doing. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that uh, when you arrive to that level, most people, they believe there is a button on the software that says, click here, you design me a car, or click there, you design me a bike. It's not like that. So it's, it's like, uh, and again, as I said, for me, it works of what my important points are, and then what is the function and how you connect those bits. Mm -hmm. And if I may say, I think there's far too much focus on design, on the design step, which is a tiny, tiny aspect of success in engineering, success in production. And, you know, people think, hey, additive means generative design, additive means lightweighting, but it doesn't have to. And it's, it's only a fraction of, of that mind share. It's about how are you using your materials? How does your material property change? <coughs> when a laser hits it and melts it with your laser powder bed fusion. Now, how do you make those decisions? And I really think that D in DFAM should be decision-making for additive manufacturing as you scale through that workflow. Okay. Why don't I keep it down? <laughs> <laughs> we should put the next chair. That was the chair. So, uh, again, uh, that, the material, is a very important point. Like, uh, for me, when I start getting involved in additive, uh, I look materials available and I realized that titanium was a good material at the time, we're talking about around 2015 at the time. And uh, aluminium, there was nothing really out there that was quite up to scratch. This aluminium, silicon, and magnesium is, is all right for some things, but not really very good uh, in terms of high strength. So I searched and searched for a high strength aluminium alloy. And I ended up going for scum alloy. I'm not, I'm not selling scum alloy, by the way. Okay? <laughs> I'm not an agent or anything. But the way that I, uh, I arrived to that is I looked on what are my mechanical properties. Yield strength of scum alloy is about double of that of aluminum silicon. So in effect, what you do, you can uh, design a stronger, lighter component. That's, that's how I approached it. And the problem that I have with today's graduates you tell them what is the Young's modulus of aluminium or steel or titanium, <coughs> they say, I don't know. It's just like, how are you going to select the material? You know, <laughs> what is the strength of the material? What is the, the modulus or something like this? And usually, they don't know. They say, I'll ask Google. But if you don't have an idea in your head, you, don't, you need to have an idea before you go into the detail. Sorry. <laughs> and I, I don't know, like, kind of, you know, labor the point here too, but I think it's actually cost engineering, value engineering. Yeah. I mean, we've, we sat down with our friends at Airbus the other day and they said, you know, cost that we were doing, but cost engineering, reducing that cost down, how can you actually meet the business goal? Go ahead, Stephen. No, I'm just thinking of my friends at Airbus. Um, <laughs> Christina. <laughs> well, let's round up the panel if you want. Listen, Christina, do you want to? Oh, yes. Uh, I was going to ask you actually what was the percentage of the courses spent towards each one, you know, towards material science and, you know, uh, software and uh, hardware, uh, you know, if it's of a, an equal split and, and how much of the, you know, the students, if they can have a good overview of everything that will be needed to, to do that. Yeah, so we, I mean, our course is basically structured, the first part of it is the, the kind of basics, right, different technologies, benefits and limitations of each, so they're definitely not coming out thinking it's all FDM on a desktop printer. Um, so we spend a bit of time doing that. We used to focus a bit too much on machines and processes, so we now spend a lot more time saying, how do you judge whether a process is right for what you're doing, um, what are the intricacies of the processes, what things do you need to think about, you know, supports, orientation, that kind of thing. Um, and actually something that works quite well for us, our coursework assessment, um, 
the students basically have to design a product for additive manufacturing, but justify all of those, you mentioned the decision in, in DFAB, but justify each decision, including you know, what process they're gonna use, what materials. Sometimes they'll go down to the specific machine and say, actually, we need this specific machine because it's the only thing that's the right size or that we can do the right orientation. Um, so it's a lot more about the decision making rather than kind of this is the latest printer from such and such a company because in my experience that changes every five minutes like there's always a new system or a new process but actually for the students how they how can they judge that so someone says here's a great new machine great how do you know do, do you know what i mean how yes. do you know whether actually it's going to be useful for you yeah. so you have from my point of view that they have a good good exposure to the, to the whole range is your course purely so, Formula One goes through fashion trends, shall we say, <coughs> and additive is very much the latest fashion trend. So much so the FIA changed the rule book to allow certain materials in, providing the part is additively made. And, and we've, had to, we've had to tighten down on that rule book, because apart from not being able to spend as much money as we used to, um, if we thought if we thought we could get an advantage by additively manufacturing a square billet and machining the part out of it, we we are stupid enough to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the, the point of that is now I'm, I've got now fifty year old designers designing something additively, and I'm saying why 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 you can cast that, you can machine that. Why are we why are we additively making this? Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's so the reason for my question was, do they also know how the subtractive side of things, or is it they only see the additive side? Yeah, we'd hope they'd know some of the subtractive stuff from other areas of their course. We do very much labour the point that you don't additively manufacture everything, mm -hmm. and that actually choosing the correct tool sometimes means which AM process do I use, but sometimes means do I use AM? I think I had an exam question one year, which was pick a product that you wouldn't make using additive manufacturing and tell us why. Um, I had some <coughs> very interesting answers to that. Um, <laughs> some of which I think were looking around the room and seeing the first thing that wouldn't make a good yeah. product. But yeah, we, we don't cover the subtractive side in detail, but we do try to make them understand that sometimes it is definitely the best, except with your weird rule change thing when it might be the best, even though it's not the best. <laughs> no, so they, they've, what they've done is they've said that Scalmoroy, for instance, that type of material is banned under Formula One regulations. We have an allowable, and this is the wrong way, we have an allowable list of materials that we're allowed to use because the disallowable list is, is huge. <laughs> so we've got this allowable list. They've added three grades of aluminium alloy onto that and said you can only use these alloys if the part is additively manufactured and if the final part is 60% or more than the original blank. So we're allowed to machine off a certain amount, but not huge amounts. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what I'm saying? You know, if, if to us, if we want to make an upright, yeah. the fastest way to do it is to work at it and machine it still. We're not confident enough with additive. Yeah. But if we could make that rock and put it on the shelf ready, then, then, and it would allow us to use that material, then it would. I'd like to point out that if every Formula One team I meet bleeds poverty, I got a pound, then I could start an F1 team. I love the idea. Um, who else would like to ask a question? Good lad. Uh oh. Yeah. Actually, the one doesn't really apply to you, Pat, so you put this into my name. is that preference? <laughs> I'm going to talk about my least favourite subject because. Um, I, I am one, on one of the BSI committees on standards and um, if you've ever been in any of those uh, meetings, they're the most boring meetings on the planet. Um, but um, I'm in the uh, material supply business for AM, uh, polymers only, no metals. Um, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors out there. Some of the companies are saying, oh, these are durable materials. And then we ask them what tests they're doing. They're doing very lightweight tests. They're not really doing the sort of tests that the plastics industry uses, that the automotive industry uses. So my question to you guys is what sort of standards, what sort of tests, um, standard tests, would you like to see in additive? I love this topic. 
Oh, God oh, bless that's you. That's great. Oh, it's fantastic. Because I think, what do you mean by standards? You mean the process that everyone has agreed with agreed terms to resolve in an agreed outcome. And there's a lot of know-how locked into the leading tier one manufacturers that maybe isn't as distributed as it could otherwise be. And I think that's the advantage of a standard. Everyone can maybe have some commonality at least. Um, and I think a lot of the thing that we see is, so with additive flow, we can take in these material properties, these test datas, and actually embody some of those standards through that process. The production process is repeatable, or is the material handling appropriate, or is your heat treat, the heat treat that you should have been having for that material on that machine, et cetera, et cetera. And having, may I say, the ability to computationally model those standards or framing the standards in such a way so it's not an engineer looking up in a textbook and it adds to the admin, so Pat's team have to buy another 300 page tome and read through it each time they make a part. But, and I know we're doing some work, and ASTM is doing some interesting work in this too around computationally um, embodying those standards. But, you know, we as a software industry, at least additive flow, is very keen to ensure repeatability, reliability, know how, but without making it a burden. So it becomes an enabler. And I mean, we work with a whole ton of different manufacturing organizations. And you'd be surprised, actually, how little implementation of the standards they're doing. Or they've, you know, you've interpreted a standard from one tier, I'm not going to name any names, one tier one to another tier one to another industry. And they all think they're applying the same standard, but it's different. And when we're using that data to optimize something and you know, increase production speed by whatever, 200%, I want to make sure that companies producing it have the same standards, otherwise they might point to the software and go, that's wrong. And you say, well, actually, how did you handle your material here, for example? So I think it's about making it accessible and um, interfacing with organizations such as ours so that it's not a burden, it becomes an enabler. I have to say that there are more standards for metals and metal manufacturing AM than there are for plastics at the minute, but um, it's getting there. Yeah. And so yeah, like we like I just wanted to say that like in the metal space, medical devices, like like implantable components, like even the dental industry, there is there is there is there is very significant standardization efforts that happens, and people are really like production companies are held to very high standards when it comes to material mixing ratios, training levels of operators, everything needs to be like digitally signed. Um, and that's what we see at our companies. They really com come to Octon specifically to be able to have that layer of additional traceability on everything they're doing. And that's where you see in additive, it's more difficult than in classical production technologies. If you just get like a, like, like a billet of, uh, of titanium in and you're machining it, uh, there's much less variability than between others. Oh, powder from different suppliers and the powder has been reused different times. And what about machine maintenance? What about these operator training levels? Are they even allowed to handle these? components, are they trained to maintain that machine, yes or no? So there's like a lot more complexity in additive, but then once, you, um, once you're able to deal with the complexity, there's a lot of value that you gain from it. And so, but indeed, like in polymers, we're still behind. <laughs> but yeah, that's part of the beauty, isn't it? Is mm. the, the variation, the possibilities are interesting. Yeah. Can, can I add something? Thanks. Um, as I said earlier on, my, my, actually, my engineering degree is actually in composites. And uh, I remember my composites um, professor when I was studying composites, he said that uh, in composites, when you're making your component, you're also making your material. Because different fibers, different resins, or even the same fiber and the same resin, different proportions of different pressures and different temperatures gives you a different outcome. And in additive, it's more or less the same. It could be the same powder kept in different conditions, absorbed oxygen or, or uh, I don't know, humidity or whatever, it gives you different. Or the parameters are slightly different, the hatching, the, I don't know, the speed and all that. So I think the, that's why I said, I think earlier on, that I found the composites experience very useful for additive because it's the same thing. You're making your material when you're making your component. So that actually works well for me. Yeah, and the composites industry actually, so the whole trans, so I was working at Autodesk before, I was managing composites software that was used for the Boeing 787 program. 
And this whole transition where additive is now going through, well, composites went through that same transition like 20 years ago. Like to get to the set, the first 787 was incredible material certification. They needed to simulate everything while they were building. They needed to continuously be monitoring the process and compensating for like whenever you started to deviate from the process, it needed to be automatic, like needed to be corrected in real time. And so I think a lot of the things we're now seeing in additive, um, you should really be able to uh, to learn a lot from what happened to composites 20 years ago. And, and yeah, sorry, I'm okay. <laughs> you know, about that. Uh, like uh, one of the reasons why I chose to go with scan alloy for aluminium is something else is because being an Airbus subsidiary, the company that did it, they have thousands of test samples that they tested. So they have high temperature, low temperature, no fatigue resistance, and I don't know, salt spray, whatever they have. And you go to somebody else who has a similar alloy, they give you some tensile properties and maybe a little bit more, and you say, where is your population of data? And they tested 100 samples. And you say, where is my variability on this one? And they go like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> so- 100 is plenty. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but you know, I mean, I think uh, uh, they, the scan alloy guys they claim that they had 998 samples tested or something along these lines. So when I was looking for my material, I said, "Where is my material database that I can go on and apply for my designs?" And I know that I have a stable design. And uh, also, they have like uh, every year you have to recertify that your machine is doing what you're doing. You have to get the stamp every year. Whereas with other people, you just buy their materials. You're good. And then somebody decides to tweak the parameters, and something else comes out of uh, the, the machine, and then you don't know why it's failed. And I might just, just, just conclude here. There's a point here too, which is with a different, say, let's just say, laser power on the same material mm -hmm. in the same machine, you've got a different material property yeah. on that particular part. I mean, with an additive flow, we exploit that capability to increase the speed of the overall application. So some regions of a part, like you know, that bottom lower part of the bike that you just showed Demetrius might have a much more slow parameter set, more laser power, it's more extensive but then it's stronger. Another part of the bike could be more porous with a faster laser speed and, and lower power. Yeah. And that mindset where you're making your material volumetrically isn't really taught. Yeah. Sounds scary, doesn't it, Pat? Yeah. Right, but if you can predict how it's going to work because software like, say, ours, which I think is the only one that I know of that does this, no, it's not, no, it's not, no. <laughs> in terms of in terms of in terms of allocating different parameters within a region of the laser power to increase the speed, which we've certified. I mean, she did it with you actually, didn't we? So you know, scan all here, scan all there, low and fast. It allows you actually to enable that cost reduction. It enables you to have prediction, but this is the mindset training that isn't just students coming through, it's experienced additive engineers, it's experienced materials engineers, it's everyone, would you say? I'm, I'm not a materials engineer, but I'm <laughs> so far removed. Uh, so obviously additive is getting more and more used over the past few years, it's becoming more and more popular, but it's still kind of not as trusted as kind of some of the some of the older and more tra traditional manufacturing techniques. Is there anything that I guess other than cost, additive is very very costly to, to make parts. Is there any way that you foresee overcoming that or anything that is kind of a barrier at the moment to allowing additive to be in that kind of same same realm of popularity and, and use as say milling and uh, like formative. I mean, we just done a case study where with one of the major OEMs, machine OEMs, with the aluminium silicon 10 magnesium, there was cost competitiveness against die casting. For a bulky part, no topology optimization, so fixed geometry for the die cast part by also changing the production parameters in the way that I've just discussed, for fast and slow, for cost and speed. So new technologies are existing right now, established, and it's just leveraging the new materials, <coughs> leveraging software that already exists, the machines that already exist with that right mindset. And so I think that's what we, that's what we can do. So it's not necessarily true anymore to say it's, it's more expensive necessarily. If the best tools are used, if the best software is used, if the best materials are used, and the best approaches are used, and it's propagating that mindset, which is why conferences like this is so powerful and useful, 
thank you, Stephen, um, to be able to share that best practice. And that's where additive initially that like it it sparked everyone's creativity. Ah, oh, there's this magical production technology that you can make anything with it. That's how the promise started. But now, if you actually see where additive is used as the dominant like clear aligner production, crown and bridges, uh, like uh, uh, like jet engine nozzles, uh, like uh, like like uh, fuel cooled uh, uh, engine nozzles, like those things are not made with any other technology anymore. Like just the, the cost benefit trade-off in all of these use cases, additive one. But it's by being incredibly application focused, very often almost like special machines, special uh, special um, resin formulations, specific highly automated software solutions were created <coughs> to then unlock this um, just better way of making it. It's, it's with additive, yeah, but you're then able to take over a, a whole industry. And I think dental was probably one of the first industries where you really saw the shift. Like everything was first done by hand, then they moved to machining, and now it's like this: every dental app in the world has 3D printers and getting rid of CNC machines just because it's it's a better product. Um, so, because of the customization as well. Yeah. Okay. Indeed. So. We're not we're not particularly cost orientated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> believe it or not, after recent recent weeks. Um, <laughs> We're all about performance. Um, we don't really care how much we spend on it, providing it's the best way to make it and it's reliable and it's consistent. <coughs> and that's the issue. It's the reliability and the consistency over conventional methods of manufacturing where we've fallen short. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting better, but I still don't think we're at the point where we'll put, we're not. We're not at the point where we'll put a heavily fatigued part on a car. Even though it's a really short life cycle compared to an aeroplane, you definitely don't put a high, high fatigue part on an aircraft um, because we don't have the confidence in it. And we don't have the confidence in it because we see such a wide variation in the same material and the same performance of the part. And we've had, you know, we have to undergo a certain number of tests every year before we put a car on a track. So the FIA come in and they load our gearbox and smash it into a wall or they take our chassis and they push on it with big hydraulic rams and I think it's 17 tonnes of pressure we put on the roll loop, which is additively manufactured. Um, and it's probably the biggest thing we do, but it's a one hit wonder. It's only got to, it's only got to operate, it's only got to perform its function once <laughs> and work. And we don't care about it doing it again because by the time a car's gone upside down, it's toast. Um, but the things that do actively <coughs> see repetitive fatigue and impact, and we, we won't. So you see, a, you see a car going around a track when a driver, when a driver clips the curbs going through a set of corners, he does that every single lap exactly the same. And they publicise quite well that a Formula One car does six G on the brakes. So the driver's tears are migrating into his visor, and he does four and a half G in acceleration and sustained four and a half G around the corner. What they're not telling you, every time he clips that corner, that curb, we're seeing 30 G in Z. Mm -hmm. So every time you've got a component, especially on the eight board end, that clips the curb, 30 G, 30 G, 30 G, lap after lap after lap. If it falls off, it's a bit public. <laughs> we don't tend to like it, and we don't finish the race. So we, we stick very much conventional manufacturing out there. How much of a Formula One car then do you additively manufacture? A surprisingly large amount. Um, but I say, not the things that take hits and not the things that are heavily fatigued. That, that, kind, of, that kind of covers a lot of it. Um, <laughs> Because the whole car is there's no there's no chassis like a conventional car. Everything is <coughs> the car. Um, but certainly a lot of the aerodynamic stuff is um, a lot of the cooling is a lot of the oil flow stuff is um, because it allows us to do things that we can't do in a conventional world. A bit like Dimitri's bicycle, we make funny shapes to move a liquid from one side of the car to the other because it has to sort of pass through the gap between the engine and the car. 
that there's not a consistent sort of shape, so the cross section will go from oval terrain to square to <laughs> in, in, in one component, yeah. just, just to get it from A to B and keep the, the fluid flow the same. You couldn't, you couldn't do it any other way. So. No, <laughs> you, can, you can come in. Yeah, that's better. Well. Hello. Well, that's it. That's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. Uh, thank you for all your questions. As painful as we draw them out there, that was good. But um, if you'd like to give our oh, panelists a large round of applause.